OK. Any questions? Let's start today's lecture. Let's start today's lecture with a little bit of uh, history. So what have we learned up to now? We've learned that if I have two charges, the force between them is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q1 q2 over r squared, right? Who found this out? Who said this? Coulomb. Coulomb, OK. Do you know what, around which times he actually said this? I think it's 1780s. 19, not, uh, not uh, well, it's in the 18th century, right? So. But do you actually learn something similar from uh, physics 101? The gravitational force between two masses, m1 and m2, divided by r squared. And who actually wrote this down? Newton. It's Newton. <coughs> How about around which time? 1670s. I'm not sure, maybe 1680s. Okay. Now, actually, I think Cavendish experimentally proved, experimentally measured this 1 over r square around the same time, 1780s. I'm not quite sure. But then, the story of this course, as you'll see, is that this force law is correct only when charges are not moving. So if I have two charges which are not moving, the attraction or repulsion is given by Coulomb's law. Towards the end of the course, we'll see that if I actually take not only two static charges, but if I actually move this charge, I shake the charge. If I shake the charge, then it's no longer Coulomb's law. I start emitting electromagnetic waves. And the first guy to say this is around the 1870s, Maxwell. And probably later, 1890s, Hertz proved that such things exist, OK? He actually had one circuit here, another circuit here. He was the first guy to send some waves from this circuit to the other circuit, electromagnetic waves. What happened with electromagnetic waves? We actually started building up first radios, then wireless communications devices, then now today we have Wi-Fi in every building, we have cellular phones, all of which are actually transmitters and receivers of electromagnetic waves. Now there's a parallel story here you don't know about, but similarly if I have two masses, M1 and M2, if I shake uh, the formula is correct if they are not shaken, they are not accelerated. If I shake M2, I start emitting waves. So Einstein, in 1916, said there are, just like electromagnetic waves, there are gravitational waves. So then he said, OK, let's calculate how much gravitational wave I actually emit. Let's say if I take my fist, this is a mass, I'm shaking it, I must be emitting some gravitational waves. And he was, OK, I'm making it up, of course. I mean, he <laughs> if you write the numbers, it's very, very small. You almost pump no energy into that. But if you have two very heavy, very compact objects that are orbiting each other, so they are being almost shaken, right? then that's going to emit a lot of energy that you're going to, just like an antenna emits a lot of electromagnetic waves, two masses which are accelerated very fast emit gravitational waves. Unfortunately, they are very, very weak. It's very hard to measure them. So starting from 1970s, the first conception was 1970s, until today. 2016, so almost over half a century, people have worked on an experiment called LIGO. 
And last week they announced that gravitational waves are seen. They are detected for the first time. So I, this is really exciting. That's, this is the kind of stuff that happens once a century. So I think you should be excited. This is much bigger than, say, the Higgs boson or you know, high TC superconductivity. This is really huge. So then you see it's not about that. It's somewhat connected to what we are learning. Okay. I hope maybe you know maybe a hundred years from now, just like we teach how to go from static charges to electromagnetic waves, maybe. That will be a similar freshman course where you start from Newton's laws and go to gravitational waves. Now, when Hertz was asked what's the use of his, the technology he demonstrated, he said, well, I can't think of anything. It's probably useless. Obviously, it's not. For the gravitational waves, it's OK. I cannot think of any application right now. But it will actually make. Uh, it opens up a new window onto the universe. You're going to see very strange events just through gravitational wave sensing. So it's extremely exciting, all right? And you see physics is still going on. It's exciting, son. A lot of our students have this view that the things we're actually teaching them happened in the 18th century and maybe 19th century, and that's it. I can assure you that's not the case. Maybe 20th century was much more exciting than anything else, and 21st century, it seems, is going to be even more exciting, right? OK, I think we can basically devote five minutes or 10 minutes of our time to this historic development. Any questions you want to ask? Yes? So you said that uh, orbiting Mars uh, in the gravitational waves produce energy. Mm -hmm. Where does that energy come from? It come, I mean, when you have two objects rotating around each other, there is gravitational potential energy and their kinetic energy, right? <coughs> So part of this, the sum of part of that is radiated away as gravitational wave energy. Just like if I have an antenna and I put some current through it, there will be V times I power. And part of this power will be turned into heat on this antenna. But a lot of it will go away as electromagnetic waves. Okay. Any other questions? No? OK, so from these exciting things, let's go back to our mundane things. Let's talk more about uh, Coulomb's law, Gauss's law. And today, I'm going to introduce a new uh, definition or a new concept, if you want. I'm going to talk about Gauss's law <laughs> and conductors. Let's first discuss what's a conductor versus an insulator. How do you differentiate between a conductor and an insulator? Experimentally, it's very easy. Take a piece of the material you want to test, put it into the plug, put it into the outlet. If you're electrocuted, that's a conductor. If you're not electrocuted, that's a Insulated, right? So basically, conductor is any material that allows charges to flow freely. Right. But now, I'm going to make another definition. I'm going to define a perfect conductor. With a very simple property, I'm going to say electric field inside a perfect conductor is zero. Let me quantify this a little bit. I'm going to say. Static electric field. So right now, as I said in the, at the start of the lecture, 
we're just considering situations where charges are not moving. Okay. So we're looking at electrostatics. Now, why is the electric field inside the conductor zero? Well, let's think about the reverse. If there was an electric field inside the conductor, what would happen? There are charges, there are electrons inside the conductor. So the electrons would actually flow because they are negatively charged, they will flow to the other side. So this is more of a definition, not really some physical property. I'm saying if I have a conductor, it has a lot of free charges inside, they can flow. So there cannot be an electric field, a static electric field inside. If I started a static electric field, let's say I actually, initially there's an electric field here, what would happen? Charges will immediately respond to that. They would actually move to that side, move to that side, and just cancel this. They will keep flowing until the electric field inside becomes zero. So for example, so let me write this down. Charges will move. until E is zero inside. So for example, what happens if I actually take a uniform electric field? And then take a conductor and put this conductor into the uniform electric field immediately charges will start flowing inside the conductor. But that's not what we're interested in right now. We know that minus charges will go to this side, plus charges will go to this side. And how do these charges distribute themselves? They distribute themselves so that electric field inside the conductor becomes exactly zero. So I have shielded well, inside the conductor electric field has become <coughs> zero okay now any problems with this definition no okay then let's actually solve an example a conducting sphere of radius r is charged with a total charge q. Find the charge density sigma on the surface and electric field inside and outside the sphere. Right? Does everyone understand the geometry? I mean, it's very simple. I have a metallic sphere, if you want. And I'm going to put a net charge Q onto the sphere. Now, what will these charges do? They will move that, move, but why would they move? Because they actually repel each other, right? There is a net charge Q here. They will repel each other. They would like to get as far away from each other as possible. What does that mean? They will go to the surface, right? All the extra charge must go to the surface. It cannot be somewhere inside the conductor, right? Why? Because moving away from the other charges is actually 
better. Okay. So first principle, all the charge will go to the surface to get away from all the others. Okay, so if all the charge goes to the surface, what is the surface charge density? Now I know that all my charge, if I added Q coulombs of charge, all of it goes to the surface. And because of spherical symmetry, the charge distribution, charge density at each point of the sphere must be the same, right? One point is not different from another point. So sigma would be total charge divided by the total area of the surface, which is going to be 4 pi r square. Good. So then, how do I find the electric field? Let's find the electric field outside. So here is my sphere. What's the easiest way to find the electric field in this very symmetric situation? Use Gauss's law. Remember, when I have a problem with a lot of symmetry, I can use Gauss's law to easily find uh, the electric field. So how do I do this? I would like to find out the electric field at a point R away outside the sphere. So I'll actually choose a larger Gauss surface, a larger spherical Gauss surface. Now what is E dot dA on the surface? At each point of the surface, I expect dA and E to be parallel to each other, right? Why? Because of spherical symmetry. All the points on my surface are equidistant from the charges. All right? So E is parallel to the A, which means I can write this as integral E dA. But this is a constant on the surface. So this is going to be E magnitude times integral dA, which is going to be 4 pi small r square or capital R square? Small r square, right? 4 pi r square. I'm doing this integral on the Gauss surface, on this green imaginary surface I am using to solve the problem, times E magnitude. What is the charge inside? All the charges inside my Gauss surface, so it should be Q. Now I can write Gauss's law, E dot dA is Q in over epsilon 0. So E magnitude 4 pi r square is Q over epsilon 0. Or E magnitude is just like a point charge. Outside, I have the uh, 1 over r square dependence. How about electric field on the inside? Let me solve it quickly. So here is my sphere of radius capital R. Now I'll take a Gauss surface. Which is inside. That is of radius smaller. Again, I can do E dot dA. Which is going to give me 4 pi r squared times E magnitude. But what is Q in? All the charges are on the surface of this black sphere, or on my conducting sphere. So there is actually no charge inside my green Gauss surface. 
So is exactly zero. What does that mean? E magnitude is zero inside. Hey, did I actually have to do this calculation? My definition of a conductor was that inside the electric field should be zero, right? So this is what I expect from a conductor. Okay? Good. Let's solve one more example. Well, maybe before that, let me plot. Oh. Let me plot the electric field as a function of the radius, electric field magnitude. So outside radius r, I actually have 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q over r square. But what's the electric field inside? It's 0. So there's a jump in the electric field. Now, We'll see that if your electric field jumps, there must be a surface charge density. Okay, so there must be a two-dimensional surface charge density, and that's exactly what we have on the sphere. Okay, good. So another example. Let's take a point charge Q. And then I'm trying to draw a somewhat complicated shape. And then I'll explain the geometry, hopefully. Let me state the geometry in words. A point charge Q is enclosed in a spherical shell of inner radius. A and outer radius B. The shell is a conductor and it has total charge 2q. Find 1. Sigma in the charge density on the inner surface. Two, sigma out, the charge density on the outer surface. And three, electric field 
magnitude everywhere. First, let's go back to this figure. Does everyone understand the geometry? I have a point charge at the center. Then I am including this point charge like a, think of it like an oyster and a pearl. Okay? The pearl is the charge, the oyster is a spherical shell, but it's not a thin shell, it's a thick shell. Inner radius is A, outer radius is B. Okay? So I have a sphere, the inner sphere of radius A and an outer sphere of radius B. Inside these two radii, I have a conducting region. Okay? And at the center, I have the point charge. Now, what does the question ask? First of all, if there are charges in the conductor, they must always go to the surfaces. Okay? They can never just sit somewhere in the middle. Okay? They will be carried away. If it was sitting in the middle, then it would create an electric field locally and no electric fields are allowed inside the conductors. Okay? Now, how do I solve this? First, let's try to find out the charge distributions. Okay? And what are my principles? Well, I have two principles. First is Gauss's law. The second is the rule that there are no electric fields inside the conductor. Okay. So, what do I expect? Let me try to plot this, but I'm going to plot it two-dimensionally, so this is like a cut. If I cut the system, this is what I'll see. A, B, and all this region is a conductor. Now, I expect that there will be, because this is a plus Q charge, what do I expect? I expect it to attract some charges to the inner boundary, right? Why do I say that? Let me give you the Gauss law argument. If I take a Gauss surface like this, what is the integral e dot dA here? What is the electric field between A and B? What's the electric field somewhere here? Guys, come on. The point here, is it inside the conductor? Then, what's the electric field there? Zero. By definition, it's zero. Are all the points on my Gauss surface inside the conductor? So, flux is? Zero. Exactly zero, right? Excellent. So, flux is zero. What does that mean? It means total charge inside must be zero. Well, I think I'm I have plus charge. What's Q in now? I have plus Q here. Where is the minus Q charge? This must add up to zero. They must be on the inside surface. So this plus Q attracted a total of minus Q charge onto the inner surface so that electric field inside the conductor is zero. Okay. So I'm going to call this plus Q plus Q inside and from there Q inside is minus Q. Then, can you tell me what is sigma in? The charge density on the inner surface of this spherical shell. 
minus q divided by the inside the, the area of the inside surface which is 4 pi a square excellent there's a question ask the question to me let me remind you it's being broadcasted on YouTube so <laughs> okay Did I say, okay, so good. Q in, what does that Q in refer to? I wrote it in green because it is the total charge inside the Gauss surface. What is it composed of? There is a charge at the center plus there are charges at the inner surface of the spherical shell. Those are the things I actually called Q inside. Okay. Did you understand the geometry? This is a thick shell. Okay. So there's an inner surface and an outer surface. Apparently, the total charge on the inner shell, inner surface of the shell, is exactly minus Q. Okay. So that the total charge inside the Gauss surface is zero. Good question. You should ask this aloud. Any other questions? No? Good. Now, I have a net of minus Q charge in the inner surface. What is the charge on the outer surface? I must have some charge on the outer surface. So that I will call Q outside. Hmm, let's go back to the question. Hey, not so fast. The shell is a conductor and it has total charge 2Q. So, what's 2Q? 2Q is equal to Q inside plus Q outside. Q inside I've just calculated as minus Q. Which means Q outside will be 3Q. Then, can you tell me what's sigma out? The charge density on the outer surface of the shell. You can't or? 3Q over 4 pi B square. Excellent. Now, yes? In the first part of this question, you wrote uh, the statement Q in is equal to uh, zero. Yeah. Yes, for this green yeah. surface. And then uh, you uh, wrote the statement Q in is equal to plus Q plus uh, Q out and, and Q inside. Yes. Uh, why don't you write the Q in statement for the second part too? I, do, I will do it to calculate electric field to calculate the electric field outside. But here I could do that just because I could choose a Gauss surface on which electric field is zero throughout. Okay, So that it's easy to calculate Q in. Any other questions? I'm not sure if I resolved your question to you, but OK. <laughs> Any other questions? Now let's calculate the electric field. OK. Again, I'm going to do this quite fast and I'm going to so second part E field so for that let me again plot a cut diagram so I have B So okay, I'm turning this into a pop quiz. I'm not going to actually grade this, but I'm going to draw three Gauss surfaces. And you're going to tell me what's Q in for all three. Okay? So this is my Gauss surface one. This is G1. 
This is Gauss surface 2, G2. And this is Gauss surface 3, G3. Can you tell me what is E dot DA on Gauss surface G1? So on this smallest of Gauss surfaces, what's the total amount of charge inside the surface? There is only Q. So it's just going to be plus Q divided by epsilon 0. Can you tell me what is Q in for G2? I have plus Q here, but I've just argued that there must be minus Q on the inner red surface. So on the second Gauss surface, E dot DA must be zero. How about on G3? E dot DA. So it encloses everything, right? I have plus Q of the point charge and plus 2Q of the shell. So it must be 3Q divided by epsilon 0. Okay? Question. G3, okay. So let me also write this. So on the inner surface, the whole of the inner surface, how much charge did I have? So I have plus Q here. I have minus Q here. How about on the outer surface of the metallic shell, how much charge did I have? I found it to be 3Q. Okay. So for G3, how much charge do I have inside? Plus Q, minus Q, plus 3Q. Net is 3Q. Or I could have said, without bothering whether I have minus Q here or 3Q here, I know that the net charge of the spherical shell is 2Q. Point charge is plus 1Q. If I add them up, it's 3Q. Any other questions? Yes. Why there isn't an electric field because there's three Q on the outside and minus Q on the inside, since there's a difference. There is a difference. You're right. But think about the following. I, I could give a very short answer. I say, hey, this is inside a conductor. It should be zero. That's the short answer. Yes. But, sure. but the thing is, it really matters. What really matters, what Gauss's law tells us, is that. It's the total charge inside the surface. And the total charge outside doesn't matter. So if I'm sitting somewhere here, I really don't care about what's in the outer surface. What I care about is that there's a plus Q here, and this minus, it's canceled by this minus Q. I know it looks somewhat counterintuitive. If I'm an electron, the closest electrons to me are on the the surface. But somehow, the spherical distribution, their effect just cancels. Okay? You could just as well say the same thing for the conducting sphere here. Right? Inside it's zero, but maybe I'm very close to the surface charges. All right? So it's, is it a truth or something we accept? Oh, oh, it's very much the truth. Okay, so it's a, I'm not telling any lies here, okay? So really, I mean, experimentally, you can measure what's the static electric field in a good conductor. I'm talking about perfect conductors. But in a good conductor, like copper okay, or gold, the static electric fields will be almost unmeasurable. They will be very, very close to zero, okay? Now, then, can you tell me what does the electric field look like? Now, in all cases, I'll assign different radii 
But the way we evaluate this integral is not really integration, right? We'll always argue that e is parallel to dA. So the left-hand side of all these equations will be 4 pi r squared e magnitude. Always. Why? Because this is a system with spherical symmetry. So I will immediately tell you what the electric fields look like. Between A and B, the electric field magnitude is zero. Why? This is already inside a conductor. <coughs> then, here is the thing. Inside, I have just a Q over 4 pi epsilon 0 R square. That's a point charge field. And on the outside, outside of B, I have 3Q divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 R square. So that's what the electric field looks like. Now, what happened here is somewhat interesting, right? I mean, inside this electric, inside this region, there is no electric field. So what would happen? Maybe I can think of a different system. Yes, question. This one? Okay. R is the distance from the origin. Okay, so if I take any radius, it's it's the symbol for the distance from the origin. So if I'm at the inner uh, cavity here, I just see a point charge. And if, if I'm very much outside, I see a total point charge of 3Q. That's it. But in the remaining few minutes, let me discuss something else. What would happen? If I had a conductor and a cavity within a conductor, so this is a conductor, and here's a cavity. Now, if I put this into an electric field, I know that <coughs> charges will distribute themselves so that electric field inside the conductor will be zero. So I'll have minus charges here and plus charges here. So E magnitude will be exactly zero here. How about in the cavity? Would that also be zero? Well, if there are no charges inside the cavity, I can think of any Gauss surface. Think of a Gauss surface like that. On this Gauss surface, what's E dot dA? It must be zero because all points of the Gauss surface are inside the conductor and inside the conductor electric field is zero. So net charge inside this must be zero. If there is no charge on the cavity, inside the cavity, then there are no charges on the inner surface. So electric field here must also be zero inside this cavity. Now, why is this good? Because if I have a cavity inside the conductor, is shielded from the electric field outside. 
literally, if you really want to make a very precise experiment, like the LIGO detection, you don't want electric fields in your experimental area. What do you do? You put them into a, into a box made up of a conductor. Okay. Now, what I talked about is more or less for static fields, but for time-varying electric fields, pretty much the same principle applies. If you have a thick enough and a good enough conductor, a cavity in this conductor is shielded from the effects of the electric fields on the outside. That's why, actually, if you go to a good elevator, if it's made up of thick enough and good enough metal, then you will not be able to talk with your cell phone, right? You will not have any reception on your cell phone. Why? Because the electric fields created by the antennas outside will not be able to penetrate to inside of this cavity. Okay? So this is called a Faraday cage the shielding principle. Let's take a 10 minute break and when you come back we are actually going to have a quiz at the start of the lecture. So be here exactly at 40 past the hour. <laughs>